We're starting uh, off uh, news from the, the 31st ASEAN summit, which kicked off in Manila today. As world leaders gathered there to discuss various political, security, and economic issues, the Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi has also arrived at the venue of the summit. He was greeted there by the Philippines President uh, Mr. Rodrigo Duterte. A number of leaders, of course, already making their way across to. Uh, the Philippines for the ASEAN summit. There you have it, visuals of uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi arriving at the venue in Manila for the 50th year of the ASEAN. Remember, this uh, is significant for uh, India, not just because of the fact that this is uh, a continued relationship between India and ASEAN countries, a key part of Prime Minister Modi's uh, Look East policy and Act East policy. But uh, Prime Minister Modi is also the first Indian Prime Minister to go to the Philippines since uh, the former Prime Minister Indira Gandhi. Now, the Philippines President Rodrigo Duterte will lead the opening ceremony. It's slated at the Cultural Center. It's uh, going to start shortly. Of course, uh, right now it is the dignitaries who are arriving for the summit. The focus there on uh, the welcome. But the summit also comes at a time when maritime security is of key concern to regional players and, of course, the United States as well. There's growing threats of extremism and terrorism across the world. In fact, the Philippines only just recovering from uh, the siege laid by IS-affiliated terrorists in its southernmost island of Marawi. More than a thousand lives have been lost in the battle to retake Marawi from uh, the Islamic State affiliated terrorists. Now, nuclear non proliferation is also becoming more and more worrying for the US, especially, and uh, of course, an important issue that's probably going to come up for discussion, as is the issue of migration. Now, these are all expected to be discussed at the three day summit. The thorny issue of China's aggressive military maneuvers in the disputed South China Sea, North Korea's nuclear missile tests, and overall security architecture in the region will also come up for discussion during the ASEAN summit. My colleague, we on senior correspondent Ramesh Ramachandran is in Manila tracking all the latest for us from there. Good morning once again, uh, Ramesh. We were just seeing visuals, of course, of uh, Philippines' President Rodrigo Duterte welcoming all the leaders to the cultural center where uh, the summit is expected to kick off. But uh, where we left off the last time you and I were talking, we were addressing the, the thorny issue of China and uh, maritime security. We know that China has been uh, sort of buffeting its uh, naval capabilities uh, uh, tremendously in the past. Do you think that uh, this area, the South China Sea and of course maritime security are going to be some of the key or rather one of the key areas of conversation at the summit? Absolutely, without doubt, Aisha, even as the world leaders are gathering at the venue of the inaugural of the ASEAN summit, the proverbial elephant in the room, as always, is China. And China's shadow looms large over the negotiations, deliberations here over the next couple of days here in Manila. Now, that said, uh, China was already in the news and the South China Sea in particular at the apex summit, which concluded most recently in Vietnam, where President Trump and other leaders were in attendance. And there, too, the narrative was uh, centered around China's aggressive maneuvers and postures in the South China Sea issue, which is causing anxieties to many countries in the ASEAN region, including but not limited to Vietnam and the Philippines. So the idea behind the gathering here in Manila today is that the ASEAN countries in particular would want to have a, some sort of a binding code of conduct in the South China Sea in particular, which will be applicable to all countries uh, in the ASEAN region plus China, so that tempers could be controlled on the, in, on the South China Sea issue. Now, that said, China, for its part, continues to improve its existing infrastructure in the South China Sea, including building artificial islands and airstrips, which can be used, which has strategic dual use, uh, uh, dual value in terms of uh, landing in, uh, for, the, for its uh, Air Force uh, uh, planes and aircraft. So clearly, this has strategic significance for uh, all the countries in the region, and it also impinges upon some ASEAN countries' territorial integrity and sovereignty. That's the key issue that is concerning or agitating the minds of many ASEAN leaders here in Manila, how to go about resolving the maritime dispute, the overlapping claims uh, by some countries in the ASEAN along with that of China. 
So that is one issue which will be discussed. The other issue, as you mentioned, is counterterrorism. And President Rodrigo Duterte of the Philippines, for his part, will like to showcase the, his success, his government's success, in pushing out the so-called Islamic State rebels from the southern Philippine city of Marawi. Now, Marawi, as, we, as you know, has, was under siege for, uh, for almost a year now, for almost five months. And in the last couple of months, we've seen the forces gain control and of, of the territory and push out the so-called Islamic State rebels. So President Duterte would like to talk about his government's success in counter-terrorism and counter-radicalization, which is instructive for all countries in the region, including India, which, by the way, suffers from the same phenomenon or menace of cross-border terrorism. The third issue which might come up is the North Korean nuclear issue, and that is something which has been in the news for many, many months now. It remains to be seen how the ASEAN countries decide to either mediate or intervene in the nuclear crisis or obtaining on the Korean Peninsula. Remember, South Korea is a key member of the East Asia Summit, and that will take place here tomorrow. So this issue will likely figure the discussions at the, at the various uh, you know, pull-out uh, uh, summits and, and breakaway sessions here in Manila as well. Right. Uh, so a key issue is already laid out by you, uh, uh, Ramesh, for our viewers. Uh, just as an aside, though, just want to remind our viewers that uh, there are a number of leaders who are arriving. The Malaysian Prime Minister and his wife, uh, just the latest to walk into the Cultural Center. Ramesh, uh, you mentioned, uh, of course, uh, a number of issues. And I have to ask you about the China question. Now, does China find itself in a new sort of uh, position, so to speak, uh, in the new world order, considering, of course, the fact that the U.S. president was recently in China, but just a few short hours after leaving Beijing, uh, there was a complete turnaround in his uh, tough talk, so to speak, on Beijing and trade policies on uh, uh, China's belligerence in the area. And, of course, uh, we're also seeing China being uh, pressed when it comes to its relationship with North Korea, by the United States, by other countries. So does China find itself in a unique and slightly isolated uh, position today uh, at a summit such as the ASEAN, where perhaps it's always expected to take on the more big brother sort of role? Absolutely, Aisha. I couldn't more agree with you. There's a paradox here. The paradox here is that uh, on the one hand, while Philippines has an existing maritime dispute with China, the protest happening in Manila this morning and over the last couple of days is not particularly against Chinese Premier Lei Ka-chiang, who is attending these summits, but against President Donald Trump of the U.S. Now, that's a paradox which has not gone unnoticed among many visitors covering the, the summits here. The protests are taking place at regular intervals at outside the U.S. Embassy here in Manila at other vantage points throughout the city with uh, protesters chanting slogans against President Trump and America and uh, opposing or criticizing his policies of globalization. But that said, President Trump, for his part, is not a great advocate of globalization. But that rem the fact remains that many Filipinos feel that American policies are doing more harm than good to their life, to their economy, the country's economy. And that's why they are protesting and gathering in small numbers, small groups at key locations in the city. Added to that is the other issue of traffic. Now, this might seem very trivial, Aisha, but the fact remains that many locals are uh, you know, anxious and probably angry about uh, the traffic restrictions placed on, uh, on, on their movement over the last couple of days and also over the next couple of days because of the ASEAN and East Asia summits. There are specific lanes marked, earmarked for the ASEAN delegates. And a couple of days ago, in fact, yesterday, a Filipino actress uh, was, uh, was pulled up by the police for crossing into the, the, that ASEAN lane. And today she risked losing her driver's license. And she has uh, said in her defense that, look, I am a Filipino citizen. You can't make me a second class citizen in my own country because I trespassed allegedly into the ASEAN traffic lane. So that's the situation overall obtaining the color, the flavor here in Manila this morning as the leaders gather at the venue of the ASEAN inaugural. But that's it. As you mentioned, Aisha, the, the South China Sea issue is expected to be the, one of the dominant themes or issues that will be discussed here on the margins of the ASEAN and East Asia summits. Essentially, what China is trying to do is to unilaterally change the status quo obtaining on land and at sea, and that is invariably impinging on the territorial integrity and sovereignty of countries such as Philippines and Vietnam. Now, China has what it calls the Nine Dash Line, which today stands repudiated by the International Court of Justice at The Hague. Remember, last year, Philippines took the case to the Arbitral Council at The Hague, 
and their verdict went in favor of the Philippines. But the irony is that Philippines President Rodrigo Duterte says he has no way to enforce that ruling on China because China rejected the, the outcome of that ruling and says it has nothing to do with it. So things are in limbo, but President Duterte, for his part, says he wants to invest more time and energy in talks, in dialogue with, the, with Chinese leader Li Ka-Chiang and President uh, Xi Jinping. And yesterday we saw a bilateral take place here in Manila between Premier Li and President Duterte, where both sides agreed on having more talks, a bilateral mechanism, as it were, to resolve the South China Sea issue. So these are the, some of the, you know, the big issues that will likely dominate the agenda of the ASEAN and East Asia summits here in Manila. Right. Stay with me, uh, uh, Ramesh. I've got a couple more questions for you, but just want to uh, take our viewers through these live visuals coming in from uh, Manila, the cultural center where uh, the Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe has just arrived. He's also the newly minted, re-elected Japanese Prime Minister. He, uh, of course, uh, won a landslide victory very recently in the re-elections. Remember, he called snap polls in Japan and has walked away with a resounding victory. He is, of course, in conversation with the Philippines President Rodrigo Duterte. A short while ago, the Singapore Prime Minister Lee Hsien Long and his wife also arrived at the venue, as did the Malaysian Prime Minister Najib Razak and his wife. The visit, of course, uh, high on the power quotient, a number of uh, well-recognized and well-respected leaders from across the world are gathering, of course, in Manila this morning. United States President uh, Donald Trump is also in uh, Manila. The Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi has already arrived at the venue. He was greeted there by President Rodrigo Duterte and his wife. Russian uh, President Vladimir Putin is also expected to arrive at uh, the cultural center a short while from now. Not certain of what that flag is. Let's try and guess who's coming out of uh, this latest limousine to pill, pull up at the cultural center. Let's go back to my colleague uh, Ramesh Ramachandran who is live on the broadcast with us uh, to talk a little bit more about uh, the elephant in the room, Ramesh. Uh, China, of course, coming up. Of course, uh, that is uh, Mr. Medvedev, I think, uh, who's arrived at uh, the uh, cultural center. He's being greeted there by the Philippines uh, president, Rodrigo Duterte, and his wife, Dmitry Medvedev, the latest uh, to join the world leaders who have gathered at uh, the 50th year of the ASEAN. Ramesh, we were talking about muscle flexing by China a short while back and of course uh, the challenges that in many ways poses to uh, India, poses to uh, other ASEAN nations. But is it safe to say that India and uh, the Philippines, other ASEAN members, despite their confusions or let's say reservations about China's aggressive tactics, China's position in Asia, it's also safe to say that bringing all of ASEAN onto the same page as India when it comes to China is going to be a huge challenge in itself. Without, without doubt, Aisha, uh, it's, it's, you know, in China and India are both competing and cooperating on the world stage. And the Indo-Pacific region is one area where it can be seen at its best and worst. Now, that said, very quickly, just for the benefit of our viewers, Aisha, Russian Prime Minister Dmitry Medvedev and Chinese Premier Li Ka-Chiang are representing their countries at the ASEAN and East Asia summits. Both presidents, uh, Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping, have opted out of the ASEAN East Asia summit, so they will be represented by Medvedev and Li Ka-Chiang. So that's it. Coming back to China's uh, contribution, or otherwise, in the Indo-Pacific region, the fact remains that uh, many countries, such as Philippines and Vietnam, are anxious about Chinese moves in the Indo-Pacific region. And most recently, we heard President Trump speak about how he, he might mediate or try to mediate if the U.S. is invited to do so. And that has uh, elicited response from both Vietnam and the Philippines. Both say it's welcome, but they will wait and watch and be cautious before they decide one way or another. So clearly, uh, a lot of uh, diplomatic moves are happening even as we speak on the South China Sea issue. But that said, uh, the most important takeaway from India's perspective would be, Aisha, that yesterday, even before Prime Minister Modi landed here in Manila in the evening, 
The stage was already set early in the morning when the officials, diplomats from four countries, India, the US, Japan and Australia, met here in Manila for the first time in a decade in what is known as the Quad or the Quadrilateral. Now, this quadrilateral was first mooted by Prime Minister Shinzo Abe of Japan uh, almost a decade ago, and the Quad first met. The only time it met was in 2007, but since then, Australia pulled out of the Quad, leaving the grouping in a limbo. But this year, on the margins of the ASEAN and East Asia Summit, we are seeing the revival, as it were, of the Quad. And yesterday here in Manila, the Quad met for the first time since 2007. Now, that is a significant messaging in itself for China. And China has already reacted, saying that it hopes the squad will not be one country specific as its target. And India, the US, Japan, and Australia will not gang up, as it were, against China. But that said, the message is there for all to see. What essentially the Quad is trying to tell the world is that it is for a rules-based world order. It will want all countries in the region, including China, to respect territorial integrity and sovereignty of the ASEAN countries and that no country should unilaterally change the status quo, be it on land or at sea. So that's the, that's the key message coming out of Manila uh, in, in a regional context where there's a jockeying for power and position in the Indo-Pacific region, which, by the way, is gaining currency and has pushed the word Asia-Pacific out of the diplomatic lexicon here in Manila. Absolutely. Uh, that is, of course, uh, something that India will be taking key note of. Uh, Ramesh, stay with me a minute. Uh, let's take our viewers through uh, the fact that Manila is also the meeting ground for a new bloc, a quadrilateral cooperation, which many are seeing as a counter to China's aggressive military expansion. There are four players involved in this quadrilateral, India, the United States, Australia and Japan. All of them have common interests in the strategically important Indo-Pacific region. The main agenda of this quadrilateral is countering China's maritime expansion under the Belt and Road Initiative. Also on the table will be expanding and simplifying trade ties between these four nations. Providing security assurances to smaller countries is uh, something that is going to be part of the quadrilateral's uh, ambitions as well. Another big concern will be countering North Korea's nuclear and missile test aggression. But India will have to tread with caution. This is the first time that India is bringing in big powers like the US and Australia into the South Asia region. India will effectively be building a counter to China in the neighborhood and it will be involving the US and Japan in South Asia's development project.